right, folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist. And just to make sure that we are making good time, uh, I did want to spend maybe about 15, 20 minutes uh, talking about concepts and knowledge before we move on. Um, so if you are uh, zooming in, um, what I'd like you to try to do, if, if you want to, you certainly don't have to, um, if you want to, um, draw a picture of, of what you think a prototypical dog is um, before class on Wednesday. Um, and part of the reason that I'd like you to do that is because it's going to relate to what we talk about when we are talking about uh, different types of concepts and prototypes. So we briefly need to talk a little bit about semantic memory, in particular talking about things like concepts and knowledge. So uh, initially, uh, I'm probably going to talk about prototypes and exemplars as well as scripts and schemas with you on Wednesday, but I did want to start by talking about how we organize different categories and how we organize different concepts in semantic memory. So just as a reminder for what this section is ultimately about, um, semantic memory is basically the part of our memory that is critical for general knowledge and facts, knowledge about language and the world. Um, and generally compared to, um, compared to our episodic memory, uh, this typically will lack a source. So you can remember what you had for breakfast or for brunch yesterday, um, and you can very easily find the source of that memory. Now, in comparison, something like um, something like where you learned two plus two is four is going to be different. You demonstrate that you have that memory by answering four, but you may not necessarily remember where you first learned it. And it's because you've repeated it so often, the fact itself has become divorced from a source. And that's kind of how we separate episodic and semantic memory. So we're going to start by talking about how different types of concepts um, are organized in memory and in mind. And in particular, we're going to talk about three different types of models. We're going to talk about something that is referred to as the hierarchical model. We're going to talk about the spreading activation model and uh, something known as perceptual functional theory. So first of all, what is a concept? What do I mean when I talk about a concept? A concept is a mental representation, so how we tend to think about a category of objects. So what does it mean to be a dog? What does it mean to be um, a teacher? Or things like that. Um, now, when we talk about a category, we are talking about a set or a class of objects that generally, generally will belong together for some sort of reason. Animals, um, plants, fruits, etc. So how do we determine whether or not something fits into our current working model of a concept or a category? And historically, how people have tried to do this is in one of two ways. So first of all, they do something called sentence verification. So I give you a sentence such as, an apple is a fruit. And you're going to obviously say yes to that. An apple is absolutely a fruit. The idea here being that the more correctly that you identify it, and also the quicker that you verify the sentence, the more that that particular object belongs to that concept or category. So that's one thing you can do. Um, another thing that you can do is determine how related two items are. So if we're talking about the category of furniture, how related is a chair to a stool? And you can kind of figure out the different ways that that can work. And generally, the more things they have in common, the more related to each other they are going to be, and the more likely that they're both going to belong to that particular class. So concepts can be thought of as being stored in these hierarchical networks. 
So what we are first going to start with is something called the hierarchical network model by Collins and Quilliam back in 1969. And they basically believed that semantic memory is basically nothing more than a series of these hierarchical categorical networks. And they're made up of a few different things. So the first is uh, that you're going to be looking at nodes. Um, and those are going to be particular major concepts. Branching off from those nodes are very, uh, various features or specific properties that are associated with that concept. Now, I realize that this all seems really vague. So one of the best ways that we can understand it is by actually looking at an example. Um, now, before I show you this example, we have to talk a little bit about what is referred to as the principle of cognitive economy. So, for example, um, both birds and uh, both birds and fish are type of animals. Are types of animals. Both birds and fish breathe. They share those same properties. We don't necessarily want to list that a special property of birds is that they breathe when we know that fish do the same. The same. So generally, if animals is the top of our category, we want to make sure that any properties that are associated specifically with all animals, such as breeds, need to be stored as high as possible. Now, another concept that you have to understand, if you're doing sentence verification here, such as, is a bird a type of animal? Um, the idea here is that the higher, the more levels that you have to traverse in this hierarchy to verify a sentence, the longer your verification time is going to take. And again, this is one of those things that you can't really appreciate or really fully understand unless you're looking at one of those networks. So let's go ahead and take a look at one now. So here, I'm going to talk about a few different aspects uh, of this figure. So first of all, here is our categorical, our hierarchical network. We have uh, three major categories here. So we have what is called a superordinate category. Um, we have a basic category, and we have a subordinate category. So a basic category is something like a bird or a fish. Now, here's what's really interesting. Basic level categories are typically the first kind of category, are, are, are the first ways that we learn to describe different objects when we're children. So if you've ever seen my dog Smedley, uh, a little kid is not going to call it an animal. And it's probably not which would be kind of the overarching class. Um, it's also not going to call the specific breed of my dog. It's not going to say, oh, look, a child's not going to say, oh, look, that's a Vizsla. They're going to look at my dog and call it a dog, a basic level category. And we like basic level categories because they're general enough that they can describe a wide variety of birds or a wide variety of fish, but they are specific enough that um, they're, they're specific, but they're also general. And, and it's kind of an optimum level of specificity. As we get into specific types of birds or fish, um, we are going to find that these are subordinate categories. Now, there are some objects that we actually refer to at a subordinate level. If you are an expert in a given field, if you are an expert bird watcher, you probably live in subordinate categories. You aren't interested in all birds. You're looking at very specific types. Um, when we identify somebody by their face, we are actually operating on a subordinate category. So subordinate categories are the most specific. Basic is kind of in the middle, and they are the words that we first acquire in childhood. And then subordinate is just this general overarching class of objects, and it's not very specific. Um, so now that we kind of have these three levels understood, let's go ahead and talk a little bit how, about how verification times would work here. So imagine that I have to verify the sentence, a bird is an animal. Well, according to the hierarchical model, all I have to do is go to bird, 
I go up one level to animal and then I can verify it. Now, on the other hand, if I am verifying that a canary is an animal, that's going to take longer to verify than a bird is an animal. And that's because I first have to recognize that a canary is a bird, and then I have to recognize that it's an animal. So whereas with bird to animal, I'm only going up one level, with canary going up to animal, I have to traverse two different levels, and that's going to increase my verification time. So now that we kind of understand the basics of how these verification times work at these different categorical levels, let's talk about property retrieval. So notice that the general properties of animal as provided by this model include has skin, can move around, eats, and breathes. These are things that are true of all animals. And so we're probably not going to say a bird has skin, a bird can move, a bird can eat a fish can eat. All of these things are true of all animals, and those properties need to be stored in a more general class. Now, on the other hand, look at the comparison between a bird and a fish. Those properties are not the same, and so they need to be stored at this appropriate level. However, a canary has feathers, an ostrich has feathers, and in that case, we don't necessarily want to put them uh, on these lower levels. Uh, now, you will kind of notice that an ostrich cannot fly, despite the fact that it's listed as a property that all birds can fly. And so this is kind of suggesting that an ostrich is not typically what we tend to think of as a very common bird, given that it cannot fly. So this will be something really critical to think about um, as we evaluate this model. So this is the basic idea of how the model works. So which levels do we tend to use? Um, we tend to use all three models on a regular basis. So um, I may talk about furniture, and then I may talk about different types of chairs, and then I may talk about a specific type of chair, such as a chase lounge. So we use all three of these categorical levels on a regular basis. Roche and colleagues have suggested that basic level categories are going to be the first most useful. And the reason for this, as I kind of mentioned, is that basic level categories do tend to be acquired uh, first during development, and experts are going to be more likely to utilize a subordinate level because they can understand the finer detailed differences between members of a certain category. Now here is a major problem with this model. So first of all, um, one of the things that we do find is that the hierarchical model does tend to be a bit confounded with familiarity. Verification times tend to be faster for things that we are more familiar with, and that can be really, really hard to tease apart. Here's another example. So going back to this model, the time that it takes to verify that a canary is a bird should match the verification time that an ostrich is a bird. They are both one level below, and according to this model, they should take the exact same time because they're on the subordinate level and we need to go up to the basic level. I hope you're kind of recognizing that that's probably not the case. So for example, yes, I'm, I'm being cute here. It's the penguin and Robin. Uh, so a penguin is a very atypical bird. A robin is a very typical bird. We tend to think about a robin when we are asked to think about types of birds. And so what we actually end up finding is that it actually takes people less time to uh, verify that typical members, like robins, like canaries, they actually take less time to verify than atypical member, atypical birds such as ostriches and penguins and chickens. Now, something that's kind of related to this is that our understandings of categories are often fuzzier than we think. Here's a really good example. So think about all the different types of fruits that you would put in a fruit salad. So maybe we're gonna put some grapes in, maybe we're gonna put some berries in, like some strawberries, maybe we're gonna put in some honeydew or cantaloupe, maybe we put in a few pieces of pineapple. Now, would you think it kind of weird if I put a tomato in a fruit salad? Yeah, probably. 
How about an avocado? How about a coconut? How about an olive? You would probably put none of those things in your fruit salad, and yet they are all technically, according to the definition, fruits. But we typically do not think of them as fruits. So our understanding of what makes up a category is typically fuzzier than is being defined for us in this hierarchical model. So this led to Collins and Loftus in 1975 to basically um, develop what's called the spreading activation model. So this is very, very different from the hierarchical model because as you can see, there's no hierarchy here. Rather, everything seems to be connected to each other by a web of association. Here are a couple of general rules though. The closer that two items tend to be, the more semantically related to each other they are. So car is very, very close to truck, um, but it's a little less close to ambulance. And that implies that car is more related to truck than car is to ambulance. So we are kind of organizing this by semantic relatedness and distance. So the way that uh, Collins and Loftus actually kind of worked out this model, uh, there are two different ways that we can do this. We can look at how related two different words are, like bird and canary, or we can have people come up with as many different examples as birds as they can think of. The idea behind the spreading activation model is that if I activate a particular concept, such as the word red, activation is going to spread to nearby related concepts. So concepts that are more related to words like red, such as fire engine, orange, and fire, and cherries, are going to get more activation than uh, objects that are not. So that's kind of how that model works. So again, as I kind of mentioned, what happens when we encounter or think of a certain concept, ideally that's going to activate a node. Activation will then spread to related concepts. And this can account for things like typicality effects. So for example, notice that um, apples and cherries and pears are all very closely connected. If we had another um, item like a tomato, that would probably be less connected to apples, pear, uh, pears, and cherries, and thus it would receive less activation. So typicality effects where more typical items are easier to remember and easier to verify can easily be explained by this model, as can something like semantic priming. So if I prime you with the word red, you're going to be more likely to think of words like roses because they are very, very tightly connected. Ah, here we go. Um, so the final one that we are going to talk about, and then I'll kind of cut this video to a close, is the functional theory by Farah and McClelland that was developed in 1991. So when we're talking about these concepts, we're talking about them in a very abstract sort of way. We're talking about how related different objects are, um, but we're typically talking about that relatedness in terms of features or its relatedness to a certain concept. But even then, the properties are based on what things look like um, and often very little about how you actually use the object. So Farron and McClelland uh, developed this theory and they basically assumed that when we are dealing with living things versus non-living things, we're going to be emphasizing different features in our semantic networks. So with living things, we are going to focus more on visual or perceptual features. So a canary is yellow. It flies. I can see it fly. On the other hand, a non-living object such as my phone or this pen, instead of focusing on its visual or perceptual features, we're going to be focusing on its functional properties, what we actually can do with it. So a pen, one of its major properties is that I can write with it. And that's probably going to be more important than what the pen actually looks like. Now, where, and, and, and generally we are primed to deal with living things. We are constantly surrounded by living things. And it kind of fits then that um, in our semantic system, we tend to have more visual features than functional features. 
Um, and now what is the neuropsychological evidence that we have this? Um, there are many brain damage patients that will exhibit category specific deficits. What's interesting is that Martin and Karamaza back in 2003 actually reported that for brain damaged patients with this category specific deficits, many of them tended to have this happen more for living objects than for non-living objects. And it turns out that there is a separation between the brain area that's damaged and what recognition deficits we have. So living objects are, deficits for living objects are typically associated with damage to uh, temporal regions, uh, areas like the hippocampus, areas like the inferior temporal cortex. Non-living objects tend to be more located in posterior frontal and parietal regions, which actually kind of fits with um, this idea because those are areas that are really critical for aspects related to motor movement and spatial orientation. And so um, that's a really interesting way to think about it. And we don't really plan on going into much more detail about this idea, but I do find this theory very compelling. So that is all we're going to do for now. Um, we will talk about prototypes and exemplars on Wednesday. Please, please, please send me a picture of a your drawing of a dog. This is not an art contest. I am not going to be judging you on the quality of your drawing. Rather, I'm interested in how you draw that dog and what the dog looks like. So thank you very much for uh, spending some time with me talking about categories, and I will see you on Wednesday. Bye.